Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, he's the one who likes all the pretty songs, and he likes to sing along. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Birthday Bomb by the amazing artisans over at Prairie Artisan Ales. This is a deliciously complex imperial style aged with coffee, cacao nibs, vanilla beans, and chili peppers. Then the icing on the cake, it's finished with caramel sauce. Garage grade five out of five bottle caps. And this week, I picked Birthday Bomb because it is a city wide holiday here in parts unknown that's right it is the captain's birthday so happy birthday to you old wise one and cheers to the captain yeah cheers to that guy wherever he is and cheers to all of you for helping us fill up the fridge let's give out some praise and thanks right here right now captain first up a big cheers to maggie formerly of columbus currently residing in scottsdale arizona and a big we like your jib to ashley in phoenixville pennsylvania next we have a cheers going out to kim in crystal lake illinois and a big cheers to christina in san antonio texas and here's a little cheers to jeff in santa barbara california and last but certainly not least we have have a big thank you going out to Devin and Angela in Denver, Colorado. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and they helped us out with this week's beer fund for the beer run. Yeah, a little birthday B W E W R U N beer run for all of our old episodes. You can check them out. Guess what? Everywhere that you listen to podcasts. And also check out our bonus show called Off the Record OTR if you're nasty. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Murder is a broad and fascinating crime. People murder for love and for hate. Some murder for money, others for want of money. Some people murder in a cold, insane rage, and some people murder with the calculating skill of a butcher. Some people use guns or knives or their hands. Some people murder children exclusively or women. And some people plant bombs in high traffic locales and some mail them to specific targets New York City's Mad Bomber a case featured here in the garage was about an angry and yes very much a madman who terrorized New York City for 16 years in the 1940s and 1950s with explosives that he planted in public places Bombs were left in phone booths, storage lockers, and restrooms in public buildings, including the Grand Central Terminal, Pennsylvania Station, Radio City Music Hall, the Subway, and the New York Public Library. For 16 years, a period stretching back to 1940, the largest, most formidable police force in the nation had failed to hustle up any worthy leads. By 1956, the bomber's handiwork showed a lethal new proficiency. He declared his deadly intent in letters sent to newspaper editors. Each rambling, raging letter was cryptically signed FP. Desperation drove the police to pursue a course they never before considered in the department's 111-year history. NYPD was going to consult with James A. Bressel, a psychiatrist with expertise in the workings of the criminal mind. If physical evidence could not lead the police to FP, maybe emotional insights could. Since a physical description of the bomber was unattainable, New York police believed maybe Dr. Bressel 
could use the evidence to draw a profile of the bomber's inner self, an emotional portrait that would illuminate his background and disorder. Bressel told them that the bomber was a textbook paranoid schizophrenic. People suffering from this disorder, he explained, may believe other people are controlling them or plotting against them. They are typically reclusive, antisocial, and consumed with hatred for their imagined enemies. For all their derangement, they're capable of acting quite normal until inevitably some aspect of their delusions enter into their conversation. The paranoic is the world's champion grudge holder, Bressel would explain. We all get mad at other people and organizations sometimes, but with most of us, the anger evaporates eventually. The mad bomber's anger does not. Once he gets the idea that somebody has wronged him or is out to hurt him, the idea stays in his mind. The bomber, Brussel continued, almost surely operated as a lone wolf. Paranoids, quote, have confidence only in themselves. They are overwhelmingly egocentric. They distrust everyone. An accomplice would be a potential bungler or double crosser. Ultimately, Dr. Bressel was correct, and his assessment of the evidence which was simply the bomber's actions, words, and intent. This specifically helped NYPD identify, locate, and apprehend a domestic terrorist that eluded them for 16 years. The mad bomber, later identified as George Metesky, was angry and resentful about events surrounding a workplace injury he suffered years earlier. Bressel called his approach reverse psychology. Today, we call it criminal profiling. Decades later, in 1980, after four attacks, the FBI created the Unabomb Task Force. During the 80s, they failed to identify the Unabomber, and then he went dormant. The Fed suspected the terrorist could be dead, but then the attacks started up again, and in 1993, things at the task force were ramping up and a new wave of agents with differing array of expertise were brought in to work the case. Its would-be assigned task force agents all received a rather large memo titled Major Case Number 75-Unabomb. For well over a decade, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies around the U.S. investigated the case they dubbed Unabomb. By the mid-90s, the perpetrator was the most wanted serial killer in the United States, and he was one that none of his victims had ever laid eyes on. An individual so mysterious and elusive that he was known only by the case code name the FBI had given him, Unabomber, since his early bombings were directed at universities and airlines. Unlike the one big crude blast of Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh and his cohorts, the Unabomber's attacks were more like that of the Mad Bombers, but unfortunately, more destructive and deadly. These bombings were spaced apart. This perpetrator could wait and act over time. He was more specifically directed. He was clever. He was diabolical. And his motive was wrapped in layers of mystery. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of the Unabomber. On Thursday, May 25th, 1978, Mary Gutierrez was walking through a parking lot. This is in Chicago at the University of Illinois, Chicago. She is walking, minding her own business when she sees a package on the ground. Being the nice, helpful person that she is, she picks it up, obviously wondering what the package is doing just chilling there on the ground. She's looking at it, and she sees that the package is complete with shipping address, return address, and postage, in the form of several stamps, but it has not been technically mailed yet because the postage has not been stamped indicating that the postage parcel has been processed. So not processed, not mailed, so what should she do? Well, she takes this parcel to a mailbox to drop it in and send it along its way, but the box doesn't fit. So seeing the return address, she thought, I'll notify the sender. 
so she took the package back to her home. The return address indicated that the package was sent from a Professor Buckley Christ Jr. at Northwestern University in Evanston. She tracked down a phone number for the professor, and she calls him. They make arrangements for someone to come by and collect the package. Now, a messenger takes the box from the Good Samaritan's home to the professor at his office at the university. Professor Christ receives the package, sees his name and work address listed as the sender or the return address, and the package was to be shipped to another professor. This is at the Rensselaer Polytechnic School of Engineering in Troy, New York. Now, of course, Professor Christ knows that he has not sent this package to anyone recently. He does not recognize the package, nor does he know the professor on the other end in New York where the box is to be sent. Yeah, which would spike your curiosity. Yes, so alarm bells are going off. So Northwestern University professor Buckley Chris Jr. said that the package seemed strange. He did not have any reason by the appearance of this package to believe that he was in any type of danger. But again, he said the package seemed strange and he suspected maybe something illegal was going on. So he calls the university public safety officer. So unfortunately, the officer made the determination to open the package and the box exploded upon opening and injured the security officer. No one had any idea of where this package came from or who was responsible for making the bomb and setting this trap. So if you haven't already figured it out, this is going to be the very first attack of many. But law enforcement will not know this at this time. They would not have any evidence that this is the first of many to come or even the last of several before. What they do know is someone targeted someone else and attempted via mail bomb to injure and likely kill someone as well as those around them. Your very first objective is to identify the target and maybe you can trace this thing back to the sender, find out who would want to harm the target or kill the target, and that could be the person responsible. Yeah, but here it's a little different because you actually have two clues because you have a person that they're using as the sender and the victim. That's exactly right, Captain. You have to wonder just exactly who is the actual target here. First guess, it would be the person who was supposed to receive the package, Mm -hmm. this being the professor at the Polytechnic School of Engineering in Troy, New York, right? But one does not go to all of the trouble of making a bomb, putting together the package, and risk of getting caught, not to mention risk of blowing oneself up, building and packing this bomb, without a super strong desire to, quote, hit your target. So why not just mail the damn thing? Why even both with a return address, unless you intend this to mislead the police, or did the bomber hope that if he dropped it somewhere, someone would return to the sender, and then the sender is the actual target? Right. Or was the bomber worried about being seen and possibly identified, so they just left it out in the open, at some random spot so that some good Samaritan would find it and mail it for them. Or like the good Samaritan, they tried to put it in a mailbox and it didn't fit. Then one has to wonder, could the bomber not really care who the bomb injures or kills as long as it is someone near the university of Illinois, Chicago. And both addresses are simply meant to throw the cops off of the trail. So ultimately what we have here is, is an ineffective attack, but a very confusing one, at least from an investigative standpoint. Well, and the materials used in this bomb and in this package, they're they're not unique enough to give any clues to law enforcement. This is going to take us to May 9th, 1979. A graduate student, John Harris at Northwestern University, is injured when he opened a box that looked like a present. It had been left in a room used by graduate students. So this seems like a bit of a repeat in a way, doesn't it? Kind of an oddly placed bomb just sort of left for someone, anyone to snag it and open it up. So possibly completely random target or is it? Again, we have the question of are these random targets or are they actually targeted victims? Because again, we see Northwestern University as part of this whole attack. Right. 
Remember, in the first attack, the package was addressed to be sent from Northwestern University. Here, it's actually left at Northwestern University to harm someone there. Yeah, and it starts making you wonder if it's a disgruntled employee or maybe a disgruntled former student or current student. And as you pointed out, Captain, there's no real way to identify the attacker based off of the bomb and how it's constructed itself. We're assuming that the bomber putting these together was wearing gloves because there's no fingerprints left on any of the material. Yeah, they're not able to pull anything as far as forensic evidence off of these first two bombs. And in fact, because the first one was going to be mailed, you know, it had the postage and all that already on it. The investigative lead on that particular attack was actually the United States Postal Service. Of course, they had local authorities working on both of these cases as well, but they have the lead. And it sounds to me that even though they're not able to identify the attacker or the bomb maker based off of the construction of these two bombs themselves, it sounds to me like they were able to figure out that they were, in fact, connected to one another. They were linked. And I will get into that later on the suspicions of why maybe it is the actual construction of the bomb itself, but the nickname that they were giving the bomber at the postal service was the junkyard bomber Mm -hmm. because most of these items that were used to construct both of these two bombs were just, I mean, they were crude, unsophisticated bombs basically. And these were items that somebody could find at your local junkyard. Yeah, or items that they were also suspecting somebody could actually, if they were handy at all, they might have some of these items just laying around their house. And some of the pieces and and devices that were inside of these two bombs were handmade, were were constructed themselves. So Yeah, I think there was probably something similar between the first one and the second one where they go, okay, this is... We're dealing with the same individual. On Thursday, November 15th, 1979, we have an attack on a large passenger commercial airplane. This is some scary shit right here. American Airlines Flight 444 flying from Chicago to Washington, D.C. This is a 727 jet with 78 people on this plane, 72 passengers and six crew members. Mm Mm-hmm. The plane left Chicago at 8.25 a.m. going to D.C., and as they approach the Capitol, these 78 people, they hear a muffled explosion on the airplane. So we are still mid-flight, up in the air when a small bomb explodes. Now, it looks like this explosive device, thank God, did not do what it may have been intended to do. Right. However, the passenger cabin fills with smoke, after this bomb detonates in the luggage compartment. The pilot brought the plane down early at Dallas International Airport. Now, several passengers suffered smoke inhalation. Now, this is super fascinating, though, to me, Captain. A few hours after the attack, a caller, and I'm assuming here, Captain, that it was all the same caller, but a caller phoned four Chicago news organizations, one of them being the Chicago Tribune. And in the Tribune, it was reported that the caller claimed to be a representative of an Iranian student group. So this so-called group is claiming responsibility for this attack and threatening additional attacks. The caller states that other bombs might be placed in shopping areas and on the CTA. That's the Chicago's train line, the subway system. Okay, so this so-called Iranian student group, Mm -hmm. they're making these threats because they're upset that America is making efforts to try to deport Iranian students, which this makes a lot of sense because, look, it's no secret that relations between Iran and America seldom have been good at times, and they've been downright disgusting. In fact, all of the seventies was practically a nightmare between the two. And at times, most of the world versus the middle East were, were just bad. There was black September, the 72 Olympics. And just before this airplane bomb, then there was the threat from this group. Iran took over the U S embassy in Tehran and took U S diplomats hostage. And then the U S froze Iran's assets. So, It's already, this is all very big news at the time. 
So it's a big mess of what's going on between the relations between the two countries. So this threat is easily believable. However, you heard that that amazing guy in today's trailer leading into the case. This is about the Unabomber. So we know that that's the direction we're going here. Right. That trailer, by the way, was a combo of some of my own writing mixed with the writings from the book Incendiary by Michael Connell and the Anatomy of Motive by John Douglas and Mark Allshaker, two books featured on our show before and two must-own books for hardcore true crime garagers. Now, to be perfectly clear here, Captain, even though the explosive device did not do what it was supposed to do, this was really a very dramatic event. I mean, imagine you hear an explosion, the cabin fills with smoke, the oxygen mask drop down, the passengers are leaving their seats and running to the back of the plane. Well, let me remind everybody, fix your mask before you try to help your children with their mask. The crew is forced to make an emergency landing. They evacuate the plane from the rear. Firefighters and fire trucks are there to greet the plane upon landing. They have to cut away a, a small section of the plane and spray everything down with foam to put out the fire. There's an actual fire on this plane. Right. So, I mean, some truly heavy, heavy stuff here. Now, it was determined that the bomb was from a small package that was being mailed to the greater Washington area. So the plane is transferring not only passengers, but mail as well on this trip. Everybody's seen Tom Hanks in Castaway. It was a fairly small explosive device with a battery and an altimer, which is an instrument that measures altitude. So this instrument could trigger the bomb as the plane was climbing in altitude. Okay, so the, the previous attacks are investigated at the local level and with USPS. Right. However, an airliner bombing is a federal crime. So here we go. Bring in the feds, and as Nick Cage would say, this whole place is a crime scene. Well, you said there was roughly about 80 passengers or so. I don't know if that's full capacity, but they believe that if this bomb would have worked correctly, it would have killed every single passenger on that plane. That's correct. I mean, we're talking about a huge death toll and just a a security nightmare, too, at the end of the day for the entire country. Well, this really ups the ante, but I don't think right away do they know that these University of Northwestern bombs are connected to Flight 444. Right. That's going to take some investigating, and the short of it for this attack is that Someone mailed an altitude-sensitive bomb to be on this airplane on a flight from Chicago to Washington, D.C. And again, 78 people who got lucky that the manufacturer of this bomb was unable to get it to be, quote, successful. Yeah, and now we got the feds on the case, and, and ho hopefully we get Julius Pepperwood on the case as well. back cheers mates cheers to you colonel cheers to you captain happy birthday Thank all you. right i'm 21 he's 21 but been drinking on the show for five years and a, and a half 21 and a half. all right el capitan we have another attack this one is on june 10th 1980 this is a targeted attack on united airlines president percy wood who was injured when he opened a package containing a bomb the bomb was disguised even inside of the shipping box. The explosive device was encased in a book called The Ice Brothers by Sloan Wilson. So the book was hollowed out with the bomb inside. You open up the book and the bomb goes off. 
The package was addressed and shipped to Percy Wood at his home. And that is, in fact, where he opened the box. As said, Percy was injured on his hands, face, and thighs when the package exploded. But thankfully, he was not killed during this attack. So we have two bombs that are connected to universities and two bombs that are connected to airlines. This is the fourth bomb in our series. Now, of course, we know that the FBI, they're already on the job. But with this new attack, they are going to bring in John Douglas, who ultimately would be just one of many FBI profilers who work the Unibom case. I think, Captain, at one point in this investigation, the FBI had about 150 agents actively working the case all at the same time. This does not include all of the local law enforcement agencies working the case throughout the years as well. Now, the agents working this attack... They're going to need to clue Douglas in on their assessment of the situation. That is as follows. One, the United Airlines has not received any threatening letters or phone calls, and neither has Percy Wood or his family. So there was no indication beforehand that this attack was going to happen. There was no request for money or any type of extortion going on with the airline or with the Wood family themselves. I mean, this guy's pretty well to do. Two, the airline has not received any ransom demand. Three, there was no obvious motive in this case or now the other three cases as well. And four, the agents in charge do not believe that this is the first bomb that this attacker has mailed or placed. Okay, Captain, so no threats and no ransom. That's pretty self-explanatory stuff, right? So... Anything you want to explore there, Captain, or should we continue? Because I really want to get into numbers three and four. No apparent motive and not the first attack or question mark first attack. Well, it's interesting because when you don't have a ransom, there's less evidence. And like we said before with these bombs in particular, there's just no evidence left behind fingerprints or or DNA that we know of or any markings to to even suggest that it's even the same bomber other than it seems like random items found around somebody's house or tool shed or junkyard. And these are extremely handmade bombs. And what I mean by that is even the mechanisms and devices, the workings inside of the bomb itself, a lot of those are handmade as well. And so this is someone who is very meticulous to be able to construct all of these items, construct these bombs and not leave any type of fingerprints or forensic evidence on the bomb itself. Plus you then have to package this baby up and ship it off. And you've not left any forensic evidence on the packaging as well. Now, I think this is a good opportunity to take a deep dive into a little analysis of violent crime study from the crime classification manual This will be good because it very likely ties into our case from last week as well, the timers or the Tylenol murders, where we asked the question, was the motive a form of public terrorism or extortion or both, or simply just a motive to kill? So the classification here would be nonspecific motive killing. A nonspecific motive killing pertains to a homicide that appears irrational, and is committed for a reason known only to the offender. It subsequently may be defined and categorized after more extensive investigation into the offender's background. Here are the defining characteristics of such a homicide. First, we have the victimology. The victims of a nonspecific homicide are random, with no direct relationship between victim and offender. Victims can be male, female, adults, or children, and demonstrate a disparity of characteristics and lifestyle. Here, as you pointed out, Captain, the interesting thing with our with our bomb attacks right. is while the individuals who are opening these packages and being injured by the result of these bombs, while they might be fairly random, you've already put together that in the first two, we're seeing a link to universities, specifically Northwestern University in both of them. And then the second, uh, the third and fourth attack, I'm sorry, 
airlines, American Airlines and United Airlines. So what what I think you're seeing here is less about the individual and maybe more about the overall organization themselves. Yeah, there is some some kind of connection there and it's not just like we see in other cases where they're random victims or if you look at the the timers that you just put bottles on the shelf and whoever gets them gets them. Mm-hmm. So it's not it, it the, so it's tough because we we're not seeing the direct link from this a terrorist to the victims, but there is a link there. And so far there's no communication. There's no one claiming responsibility. There's no one asking for money or demands. And again, it makes it just extremely difficult. Now the frequent crime scene indicators of such a crime would be that it's usually a public place. Okay. Of course we've seen that in three of these four attacks So this poses a high risk to the offender. There is nothing missing from the crime scene itself. It is disorganized with no effort having been made to conceal the victims. So obvious thing here, you send a bomb, place a bomb, whoever it affects or kills, that's the result. You're not hiding the victims afterwards. A firearm, the weapon of choice is... is, typical with this type of offender. This is what we're, we're talking about here. Captain is just like in the Tylenol murders, totally random victims, just like with a lot of these bombs, totally random victims with the exception of Percy Wood. but this also would talk and cover about the, like a public shooter, a, a school shooter, or unfortunately what we've been seeing in the news too often lately people shooting at workplaces or out in public places the firearm as douglas indicates would be the choice of weapon for this type of fender is brought to the crimes now the crime often becomes a massacre because it is the offender's goal to kill as many people as possible i think that's what we saw with the possible successful attack on the american airlines flight 444 yeah this is reflected by the use of weapons that the uh, that offer optimal lethality by multiple weapons and by an abundance of ammunition. Now, the crime scene staging is not present because it's not necessary. There's no reason for the offender to stage the crime scene. As pointed out, most of the time, these are totally random victims. And typically, this type of crime is almost exclusively committed during daylight in public places which we had in the first three of these four attacks, because the offender wants the highest death toll possible one. The witnesses often are available to identify the offender as he is unconcerned with being identified. This is interesting because in the first two attacks, these bombs weren't really even mailed. They were placed somewhere. Right. Somebody, anyone could have spotted someone placing this bomb in the parking lot where the first bomb was found or in the um, university where the second bomb was found. But it's pretty easy to just drop off a package as you're walking and not be seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that the thing that would be alarming is that it looks like a package with intent. It looks like a package that is yeah. that has a purpose. And to see somebody randomly just place it on the ground in a parking lot, I think would be something that would be abnormal. You'd think that the bomber would, you know, you have to worry about a couple things. One, bending down and placing the, the, the bomb on the ground, uh, the bomb going off. But really, you know, these are a big enough box that you would then have eyewitnesses that just saw an individual carrying a box mm-hmm. and it might not be the bomb, but that could be a lead to the bomber. Typically in this type of crime, the offender really has no escape plan because they are fine with either committing suicide or being shot at the scene by police. Now, 
Douglas will go on to say that the offender usually has a disheveled appearance, is withdrawn, demonstrates an isolated effect, and possibly exhibits erratic behavior. And the search warrant suggestions, should one get that far in their investigation, are as follows. Search the home of the suspect for weapons, receipts, and records. Remember, we are handpicking these particular items in the search warrant itself. If it's not written in the warrant, it's not seizable evidence. So he's suggesting you want to include weapons, receipts, and records. This is because you are looking for, especially in this case, this week, right. bomb making materials. And then last week's case, poisoning bottles of pain reliever. You're looking for evidence, obvious, or a paper trail, because in both cases, we have someone manufacturing the death instrument, the bomb, the poison bottles, somewhere before the attack. Well, and the fact that all these bombs are a little different, it's not the same exact bomb, and like they're telling us, I mean, we, we don't have pictures of each of the inner workings of all these bombs, but they're telling us these items could be found around your house, they could be found in a junkyard, So you would almost think that the individual would have to write out their idea of how to create this bomb. And so there'd be some kind of uh, diagram or some blueprint for Mm -hmm. the bombs because they're all different. And and if they don't take it that serious, they could blow themselves up. Right. And often that's what happens in these cases. And I can't remember if we talked about this last week or not, but in poisoning cases, especially when you're trying to poison the masses, like with with timers, And with bomb cases, especially when you're trying to bomb the masses, like we're seeing here, they often either poison themselves, injure themselves, or blow themselves up. One could only hope to be so lucky when you have a case like this that's going to span the course of years. So, of course, as you pointed out, the the bombs are different. Well, why are the bombs different? Because the bomb maker is learning. And you're exactly right, Captain. You would anticipate finding not only diagrams and notes of how one constructed the last bomb, but also thoughts and ideas on how to better construct the next bomb. This is kind of a work in progress for this bomb maker. Yeah, I agree. And you pointed out the home uh, items found around the home or, or junkyard or what have you inside of these bombs. We're talking about things like you're going to find like pipes, springs, wires, A lot of wood was used in the construction of these bombs, which I don't know if that's super typical in these types of situations, but you're also finding batteries. A lot of these bombs were powered with, with everyday batteries, Duracell, Energizer, stuff that you would find at at most people's homes. So of course you're hoping to find physical evidence of such. If you get a guy that you like as a suspect, when you go to search his home or his place of work because in the poisoning and in the bomb making, especially with the bomb making, this is time consuming activity. One would need a decent level of privacy to be constructing these bombs. If not, he could be turned in very fairly quickly by anyone who is aware of what this guy is up to. So what we do know is like what, what you're saying, this guy needs privacy. He needs a workshop. He needs Maybe he's a mechanic and he can do it at his job. But then you go, but he doesn't need a lot of money because no. the materials don't cost a lot. But he has to be somewhat intelligent or yeah. at least mechanically inclined because we don't hear of anybody accidentally blowing themselves up. And like you said, we see uh, the sophistication level of the bombs growing by by each turn now this is not the first attack obviously and it sounds like they being law enforcement were able to link these attacks together mostly based off of what kind of bombs they were seeing which again was mostly crude pretty unsophisticated handmade bombs but you're going to recognize that the construction is somewhat similar and materials are somewhat similar, even though, as the captain pointed out, the bomb maker is getting better at constructing these bombs. But each one in the series, each one of these bombs in the series, they're getting a little more advanced than the last. And the bomb maker is putting FC, FC on the bombs. Football club. That's right. The uh, Washington Football Club. Yeah. No, the... Uh, 
whoever was making these bombs was going out of their way to stamp into a piece of metal inside the bomb or on the bomb itself the letters FC. Well, there's your sign, right? I mean, so even if you, even a lay person can look at four bombs and go, well, somebody stamped FC in these. That must mean something. Yeah. Yeah, I even I could figure that out. You got to get up pretty early in the morning. Yeah, we didn't even have to turn on the computer to figure that one out. <laughs> now, the interesting thing here, though, is nobody seems to know what FC stands for. And, of course, you know that they're linked because they've not publicly announced that, hey, the bomb maker is putting FC on these bombs. So if there's a copycat out there, it's not in these four situations because the copycat wouldn't know to put FC on the bombs. Right. So the FBI was holding brainstorming sessions, trying to dream up what FC could stand for. Did, did they have any guesses of what they thought it was? Oh, the the list was incredibly long. I thought about including some of them here, but I, I don't know. They're, I'd just be interested. To see some of them were really far-fetched. Um, like, obviously, they they thought maybe it could be somebody's name. So, yes. you know, Francis, you know, uh, Cockburn or something. Well, and not only someone's initials, but then like some kind of organization, some kind of group. Right. Because usually one thing that we didn't include in that, that classification and that, that profile of this type of crime, but when you're going to profile this type of offender and you would have the same thing with the Tylenol murders case. Even when these individuals are acting alone, often they want to present the idea that they are a group, a a, a gang, an organization. They want to seem faction. They want to seem bigger, larger, more threatening than what they actually are. On October eighth, nineteen eighty one, a bomb wrapped in brown paper and tied with a string is discovered in the hallway of a building at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. The bomb is safely detonated without causing any type of injury. Now, this is interesting, Captain, and I don't know the exact details here, but I'm not sure if this bomb was simply just lying on the floor tied together with a string or if the bomb was actually tied to something because the description I found didn't state either way. And what I mean by that is remember the Mad Bomber case he would put his pipe bombs inside of a wool sock because the sock, you could tie it to something or hang it from something because you want the bomb up off of the ground. Right. You know, you want to hang that thing. So up to like shoulder level, eye level, maybe even higher, because if it's lying on the ground, you are practically shielding half of the bomb. If that's, if that thing is off of the ground, you can pretty much spray shrapnel 360 degrees, causing as much damage as possible, and often it is the shrapnel that kills rather than the actual blast. So this being the fifth attack, again, like we said, we thought he was getting more sophisticated, but we have no injuries of this one. So, I mean, good for the public, but bad that he's continuing to continue on this bombing campaign right on the the bomb itself while it may have been more advanced than the previous bombs it may just have been detected and somebody was smart enough to identify it for what it was now on may 5th 1982 a bomb was sent to the head of the computer science department at vanderbilt university this was not opened by the department head but by their assistant The bomb was sent to Patrick C. Fisher, but Fisher was on vacation in Puerto Rico at the time, and his secretary, Janet Smith, she ends up suffering several injuries to her hands and face after she opened the package in his office. On July 2nd of the same year, 1982, a package bomb is left in the break room of Corey Hall at the University of California, Berkeley. This package explodes and injures an engineering professor. I think this bomb, Captain, was just a small, simple bomb. Right. This one actually looks like it was a bit of a step back as far as being you know, more advanced than the others. This one was a small, simple bomb that was made out of a, like a little cigar box. Well, then we have nothing. So then we wonder, does this guy like to smoke the cigar? 
Well, then we have nothing almost for almost three years. Then in May of 1985, another bomb was placed again in Corey Hall at the University of California, Berkeley. This injures another engineering student. And I'm guessing that there's, again, items that, that look familiar or the style which these bombs are made look familiar. But I'm also guessing that all these bombs were finding the tag FC on. Yes, the bomb maker is stamping little pieces of metal with FC and placing them in the bombs. It's the bomb maker essentially putting his signature, his calling card on an indestructible piece, a piece that he knows is going to survive the blast fire crotch in or on the bomb. He wants the FBI and everyone else for that fact to know, look, this is me. I am still here. I am not dead. I am not in prison and I am not going away. First, we're seeing attacks on universities and then to airlines. And now we're back to attacks on universities and two in a row at California Berkeley. Yes. So whoever's doing this is comfortable in that setting, getting close and just placing these bombs in that area. Well, again, this is kind of a, a tell here because we have, Mm -hmm. we do have, like we said before, multiple people that they're sending to in the university of Northwestern, which is in Illinois. And now we're all the way in California. So does this um, terrorist, does the bomber have connections to Chicago and to uh, Berkeley? Right. And the thing here, too, is with these last two bombs, they're placed or believed to have been placed in this Corey Hall, which I, I'm not familiar with the campus itself, but I'm assuming that this is a relatively open, accessible building. I mean, I can't believe that it's a a student or faculty member that is placing these bombs there. Right. This is going to take us to June 13th, 1985. And what I think we're seeing here, Captain, is the start of maybe a busy year for our attacker. So this is when a suspicious package was sent to Boeing fabrication to their fabrication division in Washington. This sounds to me like this one was spotted and detected and identified for what it was a bomb because we have no death. We have no injuries in this attack attempt and the bomb is safely detonated. So we have a second occasion where someone is able to identify the bomb as an, as a bomb before it triggers the mechanism to explode. Yeah, see, I'm just not that bright. I mean, maybe it's because we get so many more packages now than they got back in the day. But it's like I get boxes (laughs) to my house all the time, and I I just open them up. I don't think twice about it. Yeah, that's one thing that I considered when researching this case. You know, I know my neighborhood and, and most people's neighborhoods the Amazon little trucks and vans are, are frequent flyers in those areas and constantly just placing boxes on doorsteps and, and front porches. Heck, we are subscribers and we advertise things like HelloFresh and Butcher Box and First Leaf Wine Club and things like that on this show, all showing up in boxes right at people's homes. And every time I cut open that box from first leaf, I go, thank God it's wine and not a bomb. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess the, I guess the difference is that you do see the, the shipping labels and you, you see who it's coming from. And in a couple of these attacks, the guy didn't even bother to mail it. Yeah. Of course this was mailed here for the Boeing attack, the attempt on Boeing. But in some of these attacks, they're just leaving these random packages where curiosity kills the cat. Thankfully, no one's been killed, but there's been people been injured by opening or handling a random package that they find somewhere. It's like too cheap for uh, stamps. On November 15th, 1985, a University of Michigan psychology professor and his assistant were injured when they opened a package containing a three ring binder that had a bomb inside. Now, this was Professor James McConnell and research assistant 
Nicholas Suno. They were both severely injured after Suno opened the mail bomb addressed to McConnell. So again, university, again, a package addressed to a specific professor. Well, again, now we have to go even further. Does this individual have connections uh, to Northwestern, to the University of Michigan, to California or Berkeley in California? The bomber not only indicates that he is specifically targeting Professor McConnell by addressing this package to the professor, but also the bomber included a letter with this package asking the professor to review a student's master thesis. So taking it an extra step further, Captain, addressing it to your target, but also not wanting this item to just kind of sit there randomly. This is a letter to encourage the professor to open up the binder because the bomb is disguised as a thesis in a three ring binder, simple bomb. The three ring binder is a little larger than some of the previous packages. That means it can be a little larger of a bomb, a little more destructive, but again, a simple action to trigger the bomb, take the binder out of the package, open the binder binder goes boom. Thankfully, no one is killed in this attack. On December 12th, 1985, the Sacramento B newspaper ran the following news article. The title is mystery blast kills capital merchant. And the article reads, a Sacramento businessman was killed yesterday when a bomb that had been left behind his store blew up in his face. The blast shortly after noon mortally wounded Hugh Campbell Scruton, age 38, owner of Rentec Computer Rentals in Century Plaza, this located on Howie Avenue in Sacramento. This is a little bit of a left turn. I mean, we have airlines we have universities now we have a technology store the device exploded just moments after scruton left his store through the back door and headed for the parking lot according to reports the blast blew scruton about 10 feet the first person to arrive at the scene heard the victim cry out oh my god help me and scruton was pronounced dead at 12 34 p.m at the University Medical Center. He reportedly took the full force of the blast in the chest. There were no known witnesses to this crime. The blast shook the entire shopping center, and shrapnel was scattered up to 150 yards from the point of the explosion. Shrapnel penetrated the store's rear wall, but no one else was hurt. No motive for the bombing has been established, and there are no known suspects. They said, law enforcement said, that it's possible that Scruton was not the intended victim. This according to the head of the Sheriff's Homicide Bureau in Sacramento. Investigators noted that the rear of the shopping center has a series of back doors, and identifying which door is for which store would not be easy. With the doors that close... They said, how do you know which door belongs to which business? No suspicious activity was reported by the merchants at the shopping center and interviews with employees did not turn up any significant leads in this case. Obviously, looking at these bombs afterwards, that's, we're going to lose some evidence with inside the bombs because they actually exploded. They actually worked. Mm-hmm. But again, are we seeing the signature FC in this bomb as well? Or are they not telling the public at this point that this one's connected to the other ones? Well, that's a good question because they're not really cluing us, us being the public, in on everything that they seem to know about the bombs, the making of the bombs, or who is making and sending and leaving these packages. Now, on February 20th, 1987, another bomb was left in the parking lot of a Salt Lake City computer store. So, again... Salt Lake City, again, a computer store or tech-type tech store. The bomb, this time, severely injures the business owner's son. But we have something very different here, Captain. One of the employees at that store, working at the store that day, saw a man leave the package. Mm. 
And from that witness account, we can create a composite sketch of the suspect. All right. So now we're, we're going to at least make some headway here. This led to a widely distributed sketch of the suspect wearing a hooded sweatshirt and aviator sunglasses, and the suspect is sporting a mustache. Now, do you think, Captain, that this is probably one of, if not the most well-known suspect composite sketch? Of all time, yeah. Yeah, or at least in our lifetime, that's for sure. Yeah, I couldn't think of one on the top of my head that, that would be even closely comparable. So they were distributing a few different versions of this. Um, um, D.B. Cooper is pretty popular. That's true. As far as a uh, composite sketch. They were distributing a few different versions of this uh, composite sketch for the public to see. Again, it was very widely distributed at the time and would be for years to come. But one of the early ones, I wanted to take some time here and read what is on this actual wanted poster. They were offering a $50,000 reward and stated that the suspect was wanted by the Postal Inspection Service for mailing or placing an explosive device. And it goes on to say that on February 20th, 1987, a package exploded at a computer business in Salt Lake City, Utah. Bombs have been either received in the mail or placed in the following states. So they have somehow connected all of these according to this wanted poster at the time bombs have either been received in the mail or placed in the following states utah pennsylvania illinois california michigan and washington my my gut is telling me that there's there's the signature fc on all of them again i believe you on that 100 percent, captain i think this guy he wants the investigators to know that they're all connected he wants credit for the attacks and he wants them he wants the threat of them knowing i'm not going away i'm going to keep doing this it also goes on to say that the incident has been linked to 11 other incidents which have occurred across the united states since 1978 injuring 21 people and killing one person the description is given of the suspect and is as follows we're looking for a white male, 25 to 30 years old, 5 foot 10 inches tall to 6 foot tall, approximately 165 pounds, slender build, blonde reddish hair with a light mustache and ruddy complexion, which I was not familiar with what that means, but what I always does that mean? I always thought people were saying ruby complexion because right. I looked up ruddy complexion and it means like reddish color uh, rosy color. Yeah, I thought that was like ruby. And goes on to say that the suspect was wearing blue denim jeans, a gray hooded sweatshirt, and teardrop sunglasses smoked with smoked lenses. Not a lot to go off of there. No, obviously this person thought that there was a chance that they would be seen placing this bomb in that parking lot. And even though it's behind the business, they were organized enough in their attack that they chose to disguise themselves or at the very least conceal their appearance in some manner with the sunglasses and the hooded sweatshirt. But now that we got the composite sketch, they're going to be coming out and they, they're going to tell you they're all connected Mm -hmm. and all, by the way, this is a guy that we believe is the Unabomber. Right. So we have noticed the two major shifts in this case and investigation. One, the attacks have now become lethal. The bomb maker has retooled and constructed a better explosive device. And two, now we have something on this guy. We have a witness description. So where before we simply just had the FC markings, that's the bombers, including with the bombs. Now we at least have some idea of what this guy looks like. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. My gift to you on my birthday is a promo code. Take this down. It's 420JIB. 420JIB. Use that promo code at our store page and you can save 25% off your purchase. 
and join us back here in the garage for the rest of the story. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't lose.